Welcome. If you've just joined us, I am here with lawyer Nick Freeman and author Susan Holder. And here's what's on the show uh, today. First up, as the Prime Minister gives evidence to the COVID inquiry, we're asking if the Eat Out to Help Out scheme was a mistake. It was one of Rishi Sunak's key policies to kickstart the economy after lockdown, but critics claim it helped spread the virus. What do you think? And did you make use of the scheme? After that, should we ban parking on pavements? From today, drivers in Scotland will face a £100 fine for parking on pavements or dropped curbs. Is that a good idea? Or does it make life even more difficult for drivers? And then finally, what would you do if you found a ring worth £640,000? One was discovered in a vacuum cleaner at the Ritz. It's a life-changing sum of money. So, do be honest, what would you do? Would you give it straight back or would you think, even briefly, well, find us keepers? We'd love to hear your stories. Maybe you found cash in the street or pick up a lost bracelet or a wallet and returned it. Let us know your stories. The number is 0207 862 Calls from landlines may cost up to 16 pence per minute plus any call setup fees. And calls from mobiles may cost considerably more. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, of course. Search for Jeremy Vine on 5. Use the hashtag Alexis Conran. Now, we'd love your calls on Eat Out to Help Out. Do you remember that? The scheme, getting us all to kickstart the economy. Well, was it a mistake? What do you think? 0207 862 2222 is the number that you need to give us a call. The Prime Minister is facing a grilling from a COVID inquiry as he prepares to defend his controversial Eat Out to Help Out scheme, which gave restaurant diners half-price food and drink on certain days back in the summer of 2020. Now, some experts argue that the scheme led to a spike in COVID cases that September. We're still waiting for Rishi Sunak to be asked about this specifically. But first, let's just take a look at the apology he made to those who lost loved ones during the pandemic. I just wanted to start by saying how deeply sorry I am to all of those who lost loved ones, family members through the pandemic, and also all those who suffered uh, in the various different ways throughout the pandemic and as a result of the actions were taken. I've thought a lot about this over the past couple of years. It's important that we learn the lessons so that we can be better prepared in the future. Which is indeed what the COVID inquiry is going to strive to do, but not until I think 2026 we're going to hear back from the COVID inquiry. It's taking its time. Um, let us not focus on the inquiry itself, but focus on Eat Out to Help Out. Nick, what did, did you make use of it? I did. And what did Absolutely. you make of it? Oh, it was a relief to get out, and it was a right. relief to have, you know, relatively good value food. Um, I, I'd already had COVID. I actually had COVID before restrictions. I had it right at the start. Right. Um, and it was just nice to get out in a, in a lawful manner and have some semblance of normality. Um, and was happy to take any risks that were associated with that. I mean, there's, there is a split opinion, isn't there, in terms of obviously people were dying every day, tragically. Yeah. But whether or not this scheme contributed um, to that or whether it actually there are, there are experts who say, yes, it did. And there's research that says, no, it didn't. Mm. So, so we're probably never going to know. Um, and at some stage, we needed to get on with our lives. So it was a gentle push to let, let's resume some sort of normality. So, <coughs> It was probably a good idea. It wasn't that expensive when one looks at the overall... Just um, over 800 million quid, I think it cost. Yeah, yeah. But, um, well, when, when you look at... The, sounds expensive to me, Nick. Well, I'm not well, sure. well, that's well, not just on one meal. <laughs> no, it was, <laughs> that was just on, whole, just on the next meal. It was a maximum <laughs> of £10 per head. Yeah. I think the average was about £7, £6 pound per head. You know, when you look at the cost of COVID, it was something like £70 billion. Pounds. Yes. Uh, so when you look uh, at it if, in, if the, in the it, overall yes, context... Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, bearing in mind what it was trying to achieve, it was trying to stimulate business. Uh, and, okay. You know, so he could have he could have said no. I'm just going to give more money away. Um, okay. But it was pe get get people out, get get them to, to to restart the economy. Of course, we should also talk about that. That alongside that, there was loosening of other restrictions as well. You could meet friends outside, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. And let's let's just remind ourselves. I mean, 2020. That was when it all began. So we're not talking about the year after. We're talking about the year itself. Susan, did you? Uh, 
uh, make use of it? I did make use of it, and exactly like you, I had COVID before the restrictions came in right at the beginning as well, though I didn't know it was COVID right then. I only knew when I had the antibody test later on. Um, I think if this is the only thing that people can really try and pick Rishi Sunak up on, uh, on the whole pandemic palaver, then I think it's a bit ridiculous, actually, because I do think that he was having Hello. to balance lots of different things, mainly um, the bit trying to save the businesses and all the related businesses that go into hospitality, which were all affected. And I think there was a very strong... And I think he would have been aware of it at the, aware of it at the time. They would have been looking at risks as well. Uh, and, well. You, and, and, and I think they would have done on this particular thing. Well. But he comes out of the whole pan pandemic palaver with a bit more integrity for me than anybody else because of the furlough, because of every time he stood up um, and talked to us uh, from the podium, he seemed to have a better, a better grip of the situation and his facts and his brief okay. than anybody but, else. But, but just going back on that, what has become increasingly obvious in this during this COVID inquiry, we've heard from Sir Patrick Vallance and Sir Chris Whitty, was that they found out about this scheme when looking at the media. But Rishi Sunak was not Prime Minister at the time. No, but, but, but this, was, this was a big, big uh, government's plan yeah. that had not been passed through, it, what, from what we are given to understand, the scientific advisers to the government. But I do wonder uh, if some of the people screaming about, oh, he did eat out to help out, it was a dreadful idea, were also the people screaming that lockdown should be lifted because people suffer in many different ways. Sure, and, and but, not, but, but I think, but I think it's only one but of But I think them. it's important, without passing judgment on whether it was right or wrong, we're going to hear what people are saying at home in just one second. It, I think it is important when you've got a government acting together when your chief scientific advisor and your medical chief scientific medical officer don't know what about this scheme. What made you think they were scheme? acting together? What, where have you got that idea from? Well, they, the never acted, but the, they never acted together. But the government, we know that now, but the government, and that's what the inquiry the government should was, be looking we, into. The government was, at the time, giving people instruction. Yeah, yeah. mixed messaging. Yeah. There was well, a some, people, the, some people would disagree. Some people would say that the messaging was, was but the, clear. The, Stay the, at home, what was it? Protect yeah, the NHS. Exactly. What was it? Protect Hands, the NHS. face, yeah. knees, they, whatever. They, yeah. they, the, the scientists, the medical okay. profession, were trying to keep everyone in. They were playing ultra, ultra safe. Yeah. And, he, you know, he was a chancellor, and he's okay. got a job to look after, because, you know, if the economy doesn't go, it's going to sure. result in death but, as well, isn't it? But you'd it? think someone somewhere... I still can't quite believe that someone somewhere didn't kind of do the maths on this and go, well, look, what impact might this have on the spread of the virus? And it, it doesn't but sound like it you can like make numbers say anything done. you want. Uh, Modelling never really Let's speak to Amos in Manchester. Amos, good afternoon. What would you like good to afternoon. say? Um, on Eat Out to Help Out, um, as, a, as a group and personally, I think it was an awful policy. As you say, they, they didn't ask the experts at all. Um, and for bereaved families such as mine who'd lost um, a loved one, I lost my grandma on the 2nd of April 2020, um, my mum ended up in, in hospital. We thought we were going to lose her in the second wave, which was contributed to, we feel, by the Eat Out to Help Out scheme. And certainly having, having you know, experienced what we did in the first wave, we were horrified to watch people being encouraged, as the scientists have said, to go into busy places that were high risk. Um, I mean, it was described, I think, once as epidemiologically illiterate. Um, it was expensive. We, we know from an IFG, the Institute for Government um, report, that actually it didn't particularly work financially because people only went on the days where the offer was available. Um, and did not, and not on other on other days, um, and you know it was it was certainly at a time that was we know led to this second wave, as I say, which my mother was was caught up in. Amos, did 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 you make use of it? No, I didn't, because at the time I remember, and friends of mine did, mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't do it because at the time I just couldn't see how that was consistent with what we'd been told and what the scientists were saying. Uh, and that's and that's what came across uh, from uh, Sir Patrick Vallance. He was saying it completely reversed the government's messaging that uh, mixing was a high risk. Um, that's that came from his testimony. Also, I think it was dubbed as well uh, internally as "eat out to help the virus." But what do you make though of the people making the point that at that time you needed to have a kickstart in the economy? You were facing uh, companies literally having to shut up shop uh, for good and never coming back. And this might have actually helped, even though it was only focused on the uh, uh, hospitality sector, might have actually helped save a, a significant chunk of that sector. Well, obviously, sympathetic towards the businesses, but there were other ways, and I, I can't, from the 
off the top of my head, I can't remember which witness it was, but there was another witness who said financially, you could have just given the businesses some support. You didn't right. need to encourage people to do that. And also, there were safer ways of doing it. You know, we could have had Eat Out to Help Out outside and made places safer. So they were, the, 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 then the messaging was consistent and saying, well, it's safer outside than it is inside. But that wasn't done. OK. Amos, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. And uh, uh, my thoughts to you and your family. Uh, Samantha in West Sussex. Uh, Samantha, welcome to the show. What would you like to say? Do you think Eat Out to Help Out was a good idea? Good morning or good afternoon. Afternoon. Yes. Speaking, yeah, uh, I think it was a, it's a, it was a very good idea. Okay. The reason I'm saying is people are cooked up in the houses, can't get out anywhere, mm -hmm. and they had a chance of it. The COVID was getting a bit lower. I know it was still existing, but people were following all the rules. And they were wearing masks and everything, and they were distanced. Uh, I'm and not sure people... Well, people weren't, and it was a very good idea to get out to uh, the... People weren't wearing masks in the places. I mean, I remember we made use of it once, and we only did it once because... And again, I, I, I know I'm meant to be hugely impartial here, but I've got to express my opinion. I thought it was bonkers. I found myself in a very sort of busy pub, even though we were all spaced out, spaced out, and I just thought that I cannot, my brain cannot that, compute part of, of what the... we, I've been told yeah. of, of what I need to do to protect myself. But this feels like I'm doing everything but against what I've been told. That's why people needed to do it to a certain extent because we were getting into a situation where there are some people who still have never gone back into a restaurant because they've actually been kind of sure. so affected. So actually it's all part of that. But no, the, we weren't wearing masks and you certainly aren't wearing masks when you eat. But going into somewhere that perhaps is sanitised, where there is more hand sanitizer, that's a bit more controlled, that's spaced out, mm. is better than having everybody around your hand and having a party or a dinner party, which yes. people, I think, might have been more tempted to do if there wasn't another outlet. And I think it helps with people's mental health. You Correct. Know, we're, we're dealing with people who are cooped yes. up and we're completely ignoring the fact that we're humans yes. uh, and we need that human interaction. And we're talking about the hospitality trade as though it's just a restaurant, but actually there's a lot connected it's life, to that. Isn't it? it's but, life. but there's also suppliers and farmers and waiting staff that aren't helped by a bung from the government to just the business. Mm. You need to have the business up and running for all those different people to get what they need so their mental health and their family don't suffer yeah. and their children don't don't suffer because they are, they haven't got any work. If, if he hadn't done it, there, yeah. were, there were so many more businesses Correct. that would have gone under. And the, well, the, and, uh, and the cost, what people don't realise or forget is wh wh when the, the economy stagnates mm -hmm. completely, it's a complete meltdown, you know, the, the cost implication is it leads to fatalities because of, of the, it uh, uh, it's a knock-on effect all the way through the health system. OK, let's take another call. Anthony in Cardiff. Anthony, uh, what did you make of the scheme? Good idea, bad idea? Hi, Alex. How are you doing, buddy? Very good. Good to speak to you. Really nice to speak to you. Big fan of the show. Always wanted to call in. Um, I thought it was absolutely disgusting, mate. And I, I can't believe you know, the other two panel members are back in it. It was unbelievable. It was basically... So we had the biggest health scare ever. We all sat at home. Like, don't forget, when we first got told, you know, we, we got told, say bye-bye to your grandma, say bye-bye to your granddad. We had a big killer virus coming over you. I work in asbestos for a living. So I don't even know anything about asbestos, but that's in the air. We can't see it. It's dust particles. We can't see it. We wear proper head masks with filters. We were breathing out air and breathing out all clean air, everything like that. For one, I can't believe the nation thought that those PPE masks protected you. That's absolutely farcical. Um, but the fact that the government then turned around and said to us to eat out to help out. So you, what you want us to do, you want us to leave our house to pop over to McDonald's to help, like what, the McDonald's franchise is, is struggling, is Edinburgh. I, I see you your point. Help out I, I, to, be and fair, to be fair to Rishi Sunak, I think he was talking about the smaller uh, uh, pubs and the smaller family-run businesses. I totally take your point on the, the, the big corporations that perhaps didn't need the help. Do you... Did, Anthony, did you not ascribe any value? I mean, you clearly disagreed with it. I think a lot of people will agree with you. But isn't there any value in the fact that it did help people go back towards normality? It did help people to sort of... You know, we've, we've talked about the mental health impact of people stuck in their homes for months on end. Do, do you not home, see any why, value why, of that? Why wasn't, why wasn't we told to get out and exercise and get fit? Yeah. Well, well you know, we, were, we were allowed yeah, to. We were allowed to. Anthony. The, the biggest people that were at risk of COVID were the unhealthy, right? Yes, Anthony. Am I correct? 
We were allowed to go out. We were, we were told that there was a specific amount of time every day to go out and exercise. That was permissible, and we were encouraged to do that. Yeah, but we didn't have a full-on health message in this country. That's all to they eat say. healthy. If you think going to like places like KFC and McDonald's and eating their food is good for you, I don't think they were part of the scheme. That, that, that wasn't, I don't think that was Sunak's idea. I think, I think his was, idea was the, to help the small the business. Take out, uh, uh, part, biz, part of the business. Anthony, glad we spoke. Thank you for your call. Uh, let's quickly speak to Curtis in Leeds. Uh, Curtis, eat out to help out. Was it a good idea? Yes, definitely. 100%. Why? Um, I agree with that lady um, Susan. just said that it wasn't about just health. It was about an entire oh, ecology yes. and the whole economy from the farmers to the suppliers to the workers. Um, it, obviously, it's all about balance. And although the COVID crisis was awful, you've still got to remember how okay. many people would lose livelihoods if we didn't make the decision to stimulate our economy. OK, Curtis, a quick question then before we go. Good idea. Does it strike you as odd? But the Chancellor at the time didn't, from what we know so far, we may find out, find out a little yeah. bit more information later on today, didn't take any scientific advice. Bear in mind, this was, what, six months after the virus, sort of after we've locked down? Six months yeah. later, he's going, it's all right, everybody can go back into pubs, everybody eat out to help out, but he doesn't, from what we know so far, ask a single scientist... Is this going to put people's lives at risk? Is this going to encourage the virus? Um, some, think, some people have said there was a 20% uptick. Other people have said you can't really connect that to eat out to help out. So let's leave that out. But does it strike you as odd that he didn't ask anyone? Um, it doesn't strike me as odd because obviously our government has advisors for a reason. And the advice given to the public was that you take precautions, you right. use masks, you, you keep safe space, you keep distance. And if you are more vulnerable, it is your responsibility to um, you know, make sure you are safe fundamentally. If you, if you are, feel vulnerable, you shouldn't be going into a busy restaurant. OK. All right, Curtis, thank you. Thank you all for your calls on this. Uh, later on, we're going to be asking this. What would you do if you found a £648,000 ring? It's a life-changing sum of money, so do you hand it in straight away? Or is there a small part of you thinking, well, find us keepers? But after the break, should we ban parking on pavements? They're doing it in Scotland now, so should the rest of the country follow suit? 0207 862 is the number that you need. We'll speak to you after the break. He wrote it for his son, Casper, apparently. And uh, it was initially published in three volumes. Uh, which uh, were released in 1964. And you could kind of, when you think about the gadget, of the, the yeah, car DB5, gadget... Yeah. DB, was it DB5? Uh, well... The, gold, the gold <laughs> finger and yeah, the yeah. chitty bang bang They had all these super... See, it was never all about the car for me. It was truly scrumptious, I loved. Uh, when I was a little girl, yeah. I used to go and watch it all the time. <laughs> truly scrumptious. The woman, and Dick Van Dyke. Dick you Van Dyke. Yeah. can't be to film and Was Dick it Julie Van... Andrews? Was it Julie Andrews? No, it's no, not no, Julie Andrews. No, it, no, it wasn't Julie Andrews. You're thinking, of, you're, you're thinking of Mary Poppins. Yeah, you are thinking oh, of Mary Poppins. But, yeah, you can't have a big children's classic without Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> yeah. uh, welcome, if you just joined us. Uh, Nick and Susan are still with me. Later, we're going to be finding out from you, what would you do if you found a £640,000 ring? Would you return it straight away? Or would a little part of you think, well, find us keepers? But now we're asking you this, should we ban parking on pavements? <laughs> now, we're asking this because from today, drivers in Scotland will face a £100 fine if they do it or if they park on a dropped curb. That's if any of their wheels are on the pavement. Now, campaigners say that parking on pavements is a nuisance for people in wheelchairs, those with mobility issues, or for parents with pushchairs. And it forces them out into the road, which can actually be very dangerous. Now, in London, you're not allowed to park on the pavement at all. But according to the Highway Code, you can do it elsewhere if there are signs allowing it, like this one. So, if you see that, pretty self-explanatory, I think, that, then you're allowed to do it. But if that's not there, then if you're in London, you are not allowed to do it. Um, and from today, if you're in Scotland, you're going to get a £100 fine. So, what do we think, Susan? Should we follow suit and ban it well, everywhere? Well, the, pro the problem is it's a lack of common sense, isn't it? Because I would never park 
I don't feel I would ever park where I feel I was blocking anyone, where mm. I was making the pavement inaccessible for anyone. Because sometimes just walking when you haven't got a pushchair or you're in a wheelchair or you've got mobility issues, because people don't kind of, the hedges are, or the council don't kind of trim the hedges back, there's just no room between the car and to get past. I wouldn't do it. I would park somewhere away from where I needed to be and walk. Uh, but the, the fact is, increasingly, I think, people are just leaving their cars wherever they want um, just because it's more convenient for them. And so we're all going to have to pay a price of being fined, maybe, and new, new laws... Be the only reason laws are ever brought in is because people aren't sensible in the first place. If everyone was sensible and reasonable, mm. we wouldn't need half the laws that we've got. Uh, Nick, what do you think? Well, well, as you say, in London you can't. Mandatory, it's prohibited. The rest of the country, the Highway Code, says it's advisory. Right. Um, and, and the problem is, you, 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 so basically you're not allowed to park, but you're also not allowed to obstruct the road. That is also an offence. So there are many, many places, certainly in Cheshire, where there are very narrow roads with houses on both sides, that if the cars... If one car parked on the road and not on the pavement... That would turn into a single... It, it will be yeah. an obstruction. Wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you'd struggle. You'd absolutely struggle to get one car along. Is there... so, so, as Suzanne says... It, you've got to be sensible and reasonable, and I think you've just got to apply common sense. A law prohibiting it completely will mean that certain roads become impassable. And what, what happens to the people who live there? What about... Uh, is there a, a, a legal issue? For example, if I'm a pedestrian or a wheelchair user, right, I've got every right to use the pavement yep. just as much as you do. So if you block my rights to yep. using a public footpath, yep. do I have any form of recourse? Ab Can I say to that person, Absolutely. you're well, infringing on my rights? Well, the, the, in, look, in London, it, it's actually criminalised. If you block the pavement in London, it's a, it's a criminal offence. Okay. Other councils throughout the country have bylaws which make it civil. Right. Um, so the councils owe a duty of care, they have pavements. And so if you're partially sighted, you're in a wheelchair and, you, you know, you, you, supposing you're yeah. partially sighted and, and you walk into a car and you injure yourself, you, you're going to have certainly a civil action. But if action. it's just blocking your way, what could you as a pedestrian do? Could you take a picture of it? Then what would you do with that picture? Where would you send it to get send that Send it to Nick and he gets them banged yeah, up. <laughs> to, to get that person into trouble, what do you do? Do you send it to the... the well, you the, send it to the council, the council don't you? If, to, yeah, if you're that way inclined. Parks and highways If you're that something. way inclined, you send it to the council. Um, I, look, you see, you it, talk it, about Cheshire as well and the difficulty I, I, in small roads, but you've also got... If, I mean, you, you'll know Cheshire like I do. There's places like Alderley Edge, which is quite a kind of, like, fancy place where a lot of people go to eat, that you can't walk down Alderley Edge without very, very fancy cars, very expensive, yeah. often football, just parked wherever they want outside the restaurant. You see it also in yeah, London. Absolutely. They, and they'll just... They'll pay the fine yeah, because it's just they more... Don't than, care. And their legs so do what, work, what, but they don't, they, what, they don't <laughs> park further what away should and happen, walk. like they do in France, is tow the cars away. Tow the car away. Tow, tow, tow the car away. People will change their habits very quickly. OK, let's speak to Tonya in Staffordshire. Tonya, uh, do you think we should follow suit like Scotland and if any of your wheels are on a pavement or a drop curb, £100 fine or maybe even get towed? Well, yes, because I'm disabled myself. Right. And I use a wheelchair and crutches. And if you can't get past somebody's car, you've got to go out into the road, which is dangerous, to go round, whether you're a wheelchair user or a young lady with a push chair with a baby. It's just inconsiderate and it irritates me so much. If you're not thinking about other people, it's really inconsiderate. Uh, Tonya, when that has happened to you, have you taken a photo, like Susan's saying, sent it to the uh, council, or tried to... Yes, uh, and what's yes happened? I have. And I sent it to my MP, Amanda Millie, and she dealt with it for me. And did they get anywhere? Yeah, yeah, I had an apology and everything. And oh. uh, not, I didn't get any fighting, like money or anything, but I did have an apology. Oh, well, well done, which you. Which was fair enough, but she dealt with it very well for me. OK. Uh, T Tonya, thank you. Great call to get us started. Speak to David in Cheshire. <laughs> David, are, are, are you one of those... I hope he's not a footballer who passes Footballers <laughs> with a Lamborghini that you've just left outside to come in and speak to us? Good afternoon. Afternoon. To all of you. Uh, yes, I live in a little village in Holmes Chapel called... In Mid Cheshire, called Holmes Chapel. Right. And people park on the footpath to nip into the sandwich bar or wherever. The, it's the A50, it's a narrow road going through Holmes Chapel. Mm -hmm. The church sticks out to form a, a pinch point, but nobody does anything about it. Right. You well, can go to nearby Crew, West Street, and the park on the road or halfway. 
And you've got to be very careful going down West Street. Sometimes you can only get one road of traffic going down there. Right. So very narrow roads. I, I suppose, Nick, the problem then is going to become with the, those kind of places where David's described that people just park up on the, on the pavement in order to nip into the shop and come out. If the council said, you know what, we're going to put bollards everywhere so you yeah. can't do that, but I bet the local shops will complain about well, that because and, they'll and, lose custom. And they're not breaking the law. The people who are parking on the pavement are not breaking the law. In, in England, course, they yeah. will be in Scotland, but it's advisory. Mm. Um, so, you know, most people will probably park a little bit on so there's enough room for cars to pass and enough room for well, pedestrians. You'd like you, to think well, that. If you can, because there's no perfect why don't scenario. people park more reasonably and think about that? Well, because I, there isn't space there is, sometimes. There, short, there is a shortage of space. Well, I mean, we could all go, we could go into details. Of, I could name places that I can think of where there are car parks, but people just park yeah. nearer yeah. where they want to be yeah. just because mm. they're so busy and they haven't got time. We're all busy. I mean, I'd say most, it, it's, it's easier to park in the disabled space, isn't it? Because it's nearer the supermarket or in the child. The, 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 the I think, I think there is... But we don't do that because it's the wrong thing to do. I think do. there is also... You're responsible. You're yes. responsible. There's something. also confusion because, for example, two streets from where I live, you can actually legally park on the pavement because yes. it's marked out. It's mm. actually a yeah, residence yeah, yeah. bay because the roads are so narrow. And I do think, and viewers will correct me on this, but I think drivers generally look out for other drivers rather than pedestrians. And like you said, they'll say, oh... I better put the car up on the road so I don't block other drivers, I think, I think, rather than think, hang on a minute, how's a, someone with a wheelchair going to come through? I think people are more savvy, and I think they're trying to score two goals at the same time, to be honest. Yeah. I think, I think they're, they're trying to accommodate everybody in very limited spaces, but it's not illegal okay. at the moment. So uh, maybe the law needs to change in England, I don't know. Let's uh, take another call. Uh, this is Paul in Cheshire. Everyone from Cheshire is calling <laughs> up. What is going on? Uh, hi, Paul. We ran round before we came on. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon. Give us a bit of support. Oh, there's a lot of very Cheshire-centric show at the moment. <laughs> uh, Paul, good afternoon. What would you like to say? Hello. Um, well, my mother, years ago, walked down the car that was parked on the path. Right. And slipped, banged the head on the car wheel. Oh. Within a few... I came back in, she got back home, um, she was taken to the Countess of Chester, they did a sprain scan on her because of the, the way she was acting, Yeah. Um, and it caused a tumour. Oh, I'm so sorry, Paul. She was then taken to Walton Hospital in Liverpool, she was in there for quite a while, um, where... She was then operated on to remove the mass that had grown. And they told me at the time that she had no chance of survival because of it, which I think it was probably... It's hard to say, really, because it was a while ago. Yeah. But it uh, probably four, four months later, five months later, she passed away because of it. I'm so sorry, Paul. I, I'm um, really sorry. And is this something um, that's still happening where where you live? Cars parking yes. on the pavement? Oh, yeah, no, it's quite common. And the the road where I live in, Fern Road, in Whitby, Ellesmere Port, is a very narrow road. Mm -hmm. And it widens at the other end. But people tend to not think about... You, people walk... Oh, but you can walk on the road. And oh. the law actually says it's the highway. And that is really what peeves me off with London. Right. Because in London, like you said before, if you were in London... It's not allowed. You can get done. Yeah, it's not allowed in London. Uh, Paul, thank you. I'm so sorry uh, to hear about your mother, but thank you for calling in and sharing your story. I appreciate it. Uh, let's speak to Wendy. Wendy, good afternoon. What would you like to say, Wendy? I'm a wheelchair user, and uh, it's very difficult sometimes... When you walk, when you're going around, and uh, there are cars parked on the pavement. Have you spoken to your council about it? What What have they said to you? No, I haven't. It's It's not usually the my council that uh, I have the trouble. Right. It's when I'm going to, let's say, shows in, in Cardiff and such, and there are all these cars parked on the pavement, and it's very difficult to get around. And have you ever had a time, Wendy, when you just couldn't get to where you needed to get to because there was just no way round? 
Um, no, but it's very difficult when I'm trying to get around. And when did you think there are car parks those, those cars could have been using and they're just parking there for their own convenience? Or is there no suitable car parking in the areas that you're thinking about? Uh, it's just a little way away, so they yeah. just have to walk a you little bit You see, that's the other problem as well. If car parking charges keep being brought in and keep being hiked up, then yeah. people will yeah. avoid car parks because they also don't want to pay the price or they haven't got the app or they don't have enough change. And if you make car parking so difficult for people, that's where also you get problems in little areas where you get parking all down roads yeah. just because that's another reason people are doing it. And you're so that it... Need, you need to look at the whole problem. And you're making it so expensive. I mean, yeah. I spent quite a lot of time in Germany, I spent time in Greece, so the families are spread out. We pay so much for parking in this country. We do. Yeah. We pay so much more. I mean, I don't know whether it's used as a, a, another means of discouraging people from driving, yeah. <laughs> but it's very expensive. It, it raises it raises cash, doesn't it? Yeah. That, so cash for the councils. It's, 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 you know, but it, but the, the knock-on effect has other problems. They're trying uh, to bring it in in, the, in, in a village in, in, in Presby, in, in a village in Cheshire, and we've got two car parks that are free. All right, I don't want more people from Cheshire <laughs> calling and, up on and, the show and complaining. Car parking, but it means that the street will be covered with people parking all but, down the street but, because know, they won't. The there are streets, I can think of several streets in, in Cheshire, which are very narrow, <laughs> where, where there are terraced houses on both sides. <laughs> They're never nice terraced houses. Again. <laughs> nice terraced never houses. And there's just, they, they have to park outside the houses. There is no solution. That's right. it, there's no solution. These problems okay. happen in other areas. We're just using Cheshire as an example. <laughs> other places saying. are available. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, Wendy. Thank you all for your calls on this. It is a real problem. And, I, I, you know, we haven't heard from mums with prams, and I know, and dads uh, with prams, uh, that, that it's a problem with, but also particularly for wheelchair users. Uh, it must be a huge issue, and I don't quite understand why we stand for it. Uh, uh, thank you all for your calls. After the break, what would you do? If you found a £640,000 ring just laying there, would you pick it up and go, oh, I must find who it belongs to? Or would a little part of you think, oh, I think I might keep this? Uh, we want your stories of this kind. Has it ever happened to you? Uh, perhaps you've lost something and someone returned it, or you found something and, and you did return it. You can also let us know if you didn't return it. 0207 862 is the number that you need. We'll speak to you after the break. Welcome, if you've just joined us, Nick and Susan are still here with me. And now for our final debate, what would you do if you found a £640,000 ring? Now, it just happened at the Ritz in Paris. A guest reported that they lost their diamond ring. And two days later, the hotel said it had turned up with a member of security finding it inside the bag of a vacuum cleaner. Now, all theories uh, about how I might have got there aside, it just got us thinking, that's a life-changing sum of money, assuming that you'd be able to evaluate the ring when you were looking at it, knowing that it was worth that much. But, however, what would you do? Would you do the honest thing and give it straight back? Or would you do finders keepers? It's a tricky one. 0207 862 is the number that you need to give us a call. I would love to know if something similar has happened to you. Maybe you found a bundle of cash on the street or maybe you picked up a lost bracelet or something. Um, Susan, this has happened to you, hasn't it? Well, similar, yeah, not, something similar. Not, not that I found a £640,000 <laughs> yeah. ring in pocket. That has not happened to me, just to be absolutely clear. Um, but I have lost a ring in a very fancy hotel in London uh, last year. Um, it was on the day that my book was published. My husband took me out for a lovely meal to celebrate. We are having a great time. And just as I was putting my coat on at the end of the night, I looked down and it was a kind of a dress ring, an art deco ring we'd found in a vintage shop. Mm. It wasn't worth thousands and thousands, but it was very sentimental and important to me. And it was gone. And I immediately squealed and they, we were leaving the restaurant. We were the last people there. I, I think it had only just come off my finger. They put all the lights on. Everyone kind of got down on their hands and knees. It was not found. I left my number. I kept ringing right. back. It was never found. I think it was already in somebody's pocket. Or maybe it was in a Hoover bag. Well, if it was in the Hoover bag, why haven't they called me when they emptied because the Hoover Because you don't... I don't know who they... looks through Hoover bags for rings, well, but suppose... uh, we'll come back to that well, I did later. Have them, I'd miss the ring. But on the, so on that basis, if I found a ring, I would like to think... I also would not be able to eva evaluate a ring. I would think yeah, it was Yeah, I think that, that's the issue I'd have. And I would, I would give a ring back because I think that is, some, that is not mine. All right. Well, let's slightly different thing has happened to you because you didn't find a ring, but you found cash. Oh, I found £10 walking with my dog. Right. Round a lake. And you thought? And, well, I thought, wow, that's nice. 
uh, <laughs> buy a couple of coffees and I look round, obviously there's nobody there. Yeah. No, you can't um, hand that. Who are you going to hand and, that to? And, you know, I'm thinking the nearest police station, how many miles away is that? You know, what am I going to do? Also, so, what would they do with it? Well, uh, I'm not, well, you know, a, and how much would it cost to go to the police station? Would you go back and... Yeah, so if I, you hand the, the ring to, into hotel reception, you, you don't know, know what I, they're going to do with you, that. You've got to take, it? look, the law... It, if you basically... Find, the finders keepers doesn't exist. There's no such thing. If, Legally, there's no such thing. No such like thing. common law wife. No, <laughs> yeah. let, let's not complicate. Yeah. Let's, let's not complicate. Let's bust the message. Yeah. Yeah. You okay. find something. It's not your property. You don't get title to it. You have to make. You have to go to reasonable steps to find out who the owner is. Now, obviously, that relates to the value. If it's something like a six hundred and forty-four thousand pound ring, you know, you go to massive, massive steps, don't yeah. you? So, if you're the cleaner, you hand it in. Um, and you hope there's a good reward attached to it. Yeah. But you can't keep it. It's not yours. And, okay. you know, when you talk about, you know, obviously people are going to be tempted, aren't they? And I suppose yeah. it depends on their financial situation. You know, there's a cost yeah. of living crisis. Some people are desperate. Some people think, well, oh, I'm going to try and do something. It's theft. And, even... and if you hang on to it and, you know, it, you're going to probably tell someone about it, yeah. you're going to end okay. up... And even if, you, even, if you, but even if you were desperate, I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot of kind of criminal underworld contacts. I wouldn't know how to fence it. It's Susan, come and see me after the show. <laughs> uh, right. Don't uh, ask me. <laughs> I'm only joking. I don't know anyone no, I'm with either. two good people who could right. advise on that, I think. Uh, <laughs> but we did do a lot of scams with rings when we did the real hustle. There's a lot of traditional scams that involve a ring, finding it, selling it, ascribing value to it, and then selling it on the cheap to someone who thinks, oh, it's worth a lot more than I'm getting for it. And there's a lot of sort of uh, nomenclature around uh, rings and scams. But let's uh, see what people are saying at home. Jordan in Cambridge. Jordan, what would you do? Would you hand it straight back or would you go, well, I might hold on to it for a while? Yeah, I'd sell it, to be fair. <laughs> You'd sell it? Yeah, I'd take the money. <laughs> OK, right. right. So, <laughs> lots of questions. Uh, Jordan. Should you not caution Jordan first? Uh, <laughs> you don't, you yeah. don't know who's listening here. This right, might be right, right. Well, well, this is all hypothetical. Yeah, Jordan hasn't done anything. <laughs> he hasn't yet. actually found one. He's, he's expressed um, an intent. Jordan. Who would you like, Susan? Would you know who to sell it we to? We don't need to explore, Jordan. <laughs> you can't ask him questions like that. I, I, I <laughs> can't. That's, can, that's like a very can't. leading question. Like, Jordan, Jordan I'd advise you not to answer that question. I, I seem to be asking for the defence suddenly, <laughs> and I don't know where that happens. Go on, let, let, let Jordan have his free speech. Go on. So the way I look at it is, obviously, it's a six hundred thousand pound ring, which is life changing money. Now. Yeah. If I had that ring and I lost it, I wouldn't be thinking, oh, I'm going to blame the person who obviously might have found it. I'll be blaming myself. I'll be taking full accountability because that's a lot of money to, to lose. <laughs> and I'm obviously going to assume that if they've got a £600,000 ring, then I'm sure they can afford to lose it in a sense. Or, well. or they might have insurance. Uh, and they might have insurance. It's a good Correct. point. But, but coming back to how you would sort of, you know, like, seriously, without <laughs> incriminating yourself, um, yeah, uh, I'm, like, yeah, what do you do with it? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm being. I'm, I'm just trying to be realistic. If I actually found a ring that was six hundred grand, I wouldn't sell it straight away. I'd, I'd hold on to it for a bit and think, what am I going to do? Yeah. But but I would I would try to see how I can probably sell it. Even if I sold it for three hundred grand and, and it was half yeah. price, it's still a lot of Look, money. Remove you know the I mean? stones, melt it down, and you're on your way. <laughs> uh, would you be concerned? Would you be concerned, Jordan, about the theft aspect? The fact no, because that if you were it, discovered, I, I didn't steal it. Do you know what I mean? No, you did. Legally, you did steal it. That's but, the thing. But but, but, but that's no, a good I wouldn't tell anyone, so no one would know either. Yeah, well, but, but, no, but I'm just saying legally, you, you've got a, you've got a legal you, duty um, to to make inquiries as to who it belongs to. So you are actually stealing it in the eyes of the law. And, uh, you know, a ring of yeah, that value, you're going to go I'm down for a little bit of time. But, but, yeah. but hang on a minute, though. Uh, uh, I mean, Jordan found it. He didn't steal it. No, but, Let's no, say he legally, finds it on the floor. It. When uh, he finds it, he appropriates it. OK, he appropriates it. it. If, if he doesn't make steps to find out who belongs okay, to it, okay. it becomes dishonest. Okay, legally. Okay, OK, so he goes and he says, is this your ring? You say, no, no, yeah. no. He asks everybody else that was around. People say, no, it's not my ring. Then what, 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 then what, what is he meant well, to do? Well, he hands it into the authorities. Just he hands it into the authority. Oh, okay, so yeah. you ultimately you have to hand it yeah, into that, the authority. That sort of value, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, but remember, I mean, I, I, the, the bit about this story that gets me is like, how would you know? I you would, would not know, not. unless you're in the business. Well, how would you know it's yeah. worth 640 I, I think grand? When you look at a 644 gram ring, and I haven't, you, you must think, I. wow. <laughs> that, I that's something, that's something else. I don't else. know what happens in Cheshire <laughs> with all your fancy cars <laughs> parked on pavements <laughs> blocking people in wheelchairs. <laughs> Let's uh, hear from Muriel in Shropshire. Muriel, good afternoon. What would you do? Would you would you keep it? Would you give it back? Well, originally I was going to keep it, and then I thought about it, and I thought, right, wait a minute, it was lost at the Ritz in Paris. Yeah. 
It was found in a Hoover bag by security. Yes. So obviously it's been mentioned that they've lost this ring. Yes. Then if I was to keep it, how was I supposed to know the value of it? Because I'm not a diamond expert or anything. Yeah. So to me, first of all, if it was in the Ritz, it's got to be expensive. Okay. And what, how would I get rid of it? <laughs> and like the gentleman before you, I don't know anybody that I was going to sell it to who would give me 640000 yeah. And like the lawyers just said, my luck is I'd get found out in jail. <laughs> well, right. OK. Uh, thank you, Muriel. Muriel was giving this a lot of thought, which I like. <laughs> uh, let's take a quick one from Helen in Dorset. Helen, good afternoon. Keep good it afternoon. or give it back? Give it back immediately. Immediately. No questions. Immediately. Over. You wouldn't even cross your mind. No, wouldn't think two hoots about it. What about if I... it was... Helen, what about if, it, if you found a case full... Let's not say, well, £600,000 worth of cash. If it's I not a ring. I would hand that in. What? I'd hand it in. You'd hand it in? It's not mine. That's dishonest, that's okay. lying, and it's theft, and uh, it's wrong. How lovely to hear an honest... An honest person it's on because, your show. That's because you, <laughs> that's because you frightened you everybody. Right. I just told them the law. <laughs> have, the law's important, isn't it? You have. No, look, it, it's fantastic. And also, I think I think it's good to clarify that because I do think that some people do feel that there yeah. is a sort of a finder's yeah. keeper's yeah, thing. There so. is no moral dilemma there's, here. It's straightforward law. It's as simple as there's that. There's no ambiguity but there. I think no. some people it, may be considering a career as a, a, <laughs> working in hotels cleaning up because if, if people are just leaving these kind of things around, well, they have the purpose of that they job have is... safes in hotels. Why didn't the lady put uh, it yeah, in? No, I'd no, get no, a no, super safe. powerful Hoover that could just Hoover the rings <laughs> off <laughs> the hands. Yeah, just she like reported it the same day. They were onto it straight away. They were. Yeah, straight away. They were reported. Uh, well, look, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you as well for all your calls on this. I think it was a very interesting moral dilemma there. So thanks for taking part. Well, that's it for today. And Nick and Susan have been amazing. Jeremy's back at 9.15 tomorrow morning. Have a wonderful afternoon wherever you are. See you at the same time tomorrow. <laughs>